First of all, thank you guys for asking me to do this. And sorry it took so long to do it. We're about, we're about two months out on this thing because of uh, the ice storm last meeting and then I had COVID-19 the meeting before that. So this, is, this one's been a long time coming. I almost feel like it's going to be an anticlimactic experience after such a long wait. But thanks for asking me to do it. Um, I'm Tim Kreitz, W5GFO. And uh, this... The purpose of this presentation is to delineate the difference between sunspot number, solar flux index, and uh, the A and K indices because there seems to be, I know I was really confused coming back to ham radio in 2020 during the pandemic. I, I knew the first time around in the 90s doing ham radio that sunspot number was significant and the more sunspots you had generally the better things were as far as the HF bands were but I didn't understand all this other stuff and I just thought hey lots of sunspots that means conditions are great well that's not that's often not the case so we're going to talk about just the difference between solar flux index what it is why and how it's used the sunspot number and the uh, electromagnetic field indices which are the A and K indices that you see on a lot of the data and I want to relate this no, number one I want this to be kind of a layman's type of discussion aimed specifically at us and ha amateur radio because lots of people are interested in this data. Aurora chasers are interested in it and uh, you know the powers that be our government is interested in it because of the GPS satellite system and the uh, the havoc that a solar storm and an electromagnetic storm can wreak on those systems. The Elon Musks of the world have a lot of interest in this stuff but we have a very specific interest in Th this data and these measures simply because they help us to predict when HF conditions are good on what bands and how we can take advantage of that. So um, let's talk first about the sunspot number. We, we uh, as I said, often associate the sunspot number with, hey man, we got a hundred sunspots. The conditions are going to be great. And then we get on there and there's a radio blackout or the conditions are not great, it's noisy, or the bands we thought were going to be working are not going to be working. And part of that, and I'm going to do a little bit of skipping around here uh, on my images, but a lot of that is because a lot of times you can have, <clears throat> you can have a lot of sunspots, but they're not, I guess, what we might call quality sunspots. Sunspots are different sizes. Some, spots, some sunspots are really big, some are really small. And if you look at these, we have quite a lot of sunspot groups on this little graphic that I made of the sun. And forgive the cheesiness of my sunspots, but I didn't want to take a whole lot of time to render out accurate looking sunspot groups. But if you notice, yeah, we've got a whole lot of sunspots and sunspot groups on the earth-facing disk of the sun in this example diagram, but they're all facing away from the earth. They're not exactly earth directed. So hey, we got a hundred sunspots. Well, yeah, we got a hundred sunspots, but none of them are aiming at us. So those parts particles and that radiation and all of that good stuff that we hope will charge up the, the ionosphere for us so that we get good propagation may not be happening. Also, it should be pointed out that with regard to the sunspot number and figuring out how many sunspots there actually are, uh, it's very difficult to, and I didn't really realize this until I started studying this stuff, it's kind of difficult for Earth-based terrestrial uh, solar telescopes to determine on a cloudy day at the location of that equipment how many sunspots there are. The cloud cover can actually affect that. And so, by the way, has anybody ever been to Sunspot? Has there, anybody ever been to the National Solar Observatory? We ride motorcycles up there every August. It's a, it's a ritual for us. And just for those of you who maybe have not been up there, I've got some drone video that I shot. And believe it or not, this is 100% legal drone video. I <laughs> I got my drone out and I filed for clearance and I thought there's no way they're going to give me clearance to fly up here near this near this facility and I got clearance that quick. I was astounded. So uh, this is, it's in a really, really, number one, beautiful location, but um, it's, it's up at about 9,500 feet and if you, as you see, as I, as I fly the drone up, uh, and 
get up toward the top. Now, one of, one of the things I was very mindful of on this flight was I stayed away from the optics of the telescope. I figured an, an astronomer would come outside pretty quickly and tell me, uh, you need to leave, sir. So I stayed away from the optics, but here are the optics. And, you, of course, you can see White Sands Missile Range out in the background about almost 10,000 feet below us. And, that, and so that's kind of how the facility works. So as you can see, on a day when there's cloud cover or adverse conditions, they're probably not getting optimal data. So I say all that to say, enter the solar flux index and why we use it. So the solar flux index is essentially a proxy for a lot of different stuff. And I made this little diagram here to kind of give you an idea. Um, the, the solar index is a proxy for Number one, the number of sunspots and the quality of the sunspots. And it's also a proxy for things like other things we may need to infer, but we have missing data and we need to make inferences. Well, the Solar Flux Index helps us to draw some of those inferences. And uh, lastly, it's actually a way to calibrate a certain antennae. The Solar Flux Index is essentially a, it's a, the, it's the amount of noise the amount of radio noise that the sun is making and sending our way at 10.7 centimeters wavelength, which is around 2800 megahertz. And this was first discovered in the 1940s by radio operators. Well, it wasn't discovered by World War II radar operators. It was actually discovered by civilians, but those World War II radar operators were very aware that the sun was making noise and any of them that were operating centimetric radars were noticing this. And what would happen was these guys would aim their uh, radars, and I've got a picture of one right here. They would aim their radars at the outer disk of the sun at sunup and sundown and they'd get all of this noise. It sounded really cool and they called it sun strobing. They didn't know what else to call it. They called them sun strobes. And so here's uh, one of the microwaves that operates up in that area. This is uh, the ANCPS-1. Boy, I wish Bill, uh, Bill Taylor was here. He could probably tell us every single thing about this radar system. The old military radar guys really know their stuff. Um, this was a microwave early warning radar. And it operated at 3200 megahertz. And this is the type, and it was a, it's S-band and it was semi-mobile. And so these guys could, you know, were in different locations and were using it for different ap applications for early warning systems. And uh, I was actually shocked that in World War II, as new as radar was then, that they had stuff that was this advanced at the time, but they obviously did. Now this was a, a, this was a problem of secrecy at the time. They, there was a huge gag on our don't talk about what you're receiving from the sun. In fact, don't talk about anything you're doing with these radar systems. So a lot of this information about solar flux didn't come out, if you will. It couldn't really even be talked about until after the cessation of the war. Hostilities were over with and, and we started looking into how we could use this information to benefit us. And I'll cut to the chase. We figured out how to use it to our advantage for determining solar activity and named it Solar Flux, developed the Solar Flux unit, and <laughs> I was going to bring the mathematical formula that's used to calculate the Solar Flux and the Solar Flux, un flux units, but I didn't want to frighten you all. It's a ridiculously long formula and it's just hilarious to look at. But the solar flux is taken and measured daily at this facility right here using this receiver. Um, this is in British Columbia and it's been there for, got for decades now. It originally was in Ottawa. I don't know why they made the decision that it needed to be in Canada or maybe Canada volunteered to do it. But this is uh, uh, Pen, the Penticticon, that I'm probably saying that wrong, it's a very unusual word, uh, radio observatory. And uh, Penticton is what it is. It's called the Penticton Observatory. It's a fascinating place. I'd love to have that receiver in my, just to have it in my backyard. Like I need one more thing to piss the neighbors off with. But, but uh, yeah, I would definitely take that. So, uh, so that's how solar flux index correlates with sunspot number. And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I had some notes, but I decided to go without them. Um, let me 
let me kind of roll down here and see what else I've got here that I might be able to show you. Yeah, we'll move on. We'll move on to the stuff. I've got my, my stuff out of order, but we can kind of go back. We can go back here because now what we want to do is we want to talk about the A and K indices. And I don't want to go too deeply into the math that goes into to calculating these indices because it's very complicated. One is basically a, a worldwide average. One is logarithmic. One is a bunch of really high numbers, the logarithmic ones, and, and the average, which is basically a daily average of all the reporting sites across the earth, is a low number. They go from like 0 to 9, and 0 to 10, something like that. But if you can visualize, I made this graphic to kind of help you to visualize that sunspot number and solar flux index are loosely related to one another and they come from the sun and they affect our ionosphere partially by affecting the Earth's magnetosphere and its electromagnetic field. The Earth ideally is a dipole. North Pole, South Pole, it is a dipole. And when it is, you know, in a perfect situation when there were no forces acting upon the Earth's electromagnetic field, it would look something like this. It would, you know, have a, have a magnetic, electromagnetic pa pattern that was, you know, perfect with relation to a dipole. But obviously it's got the sun and other forces acting upon it constantly, the solar wind, coronal holes which accelerate the solar wind, coronal mass ejections, uh, sunspot activity um, and all of that sort of thing. And so what you end up with is, when we can go, go back up to this, you end up with this distortion of the, of the Earth's magnetic field that you know, kind of swoops it back this way. And when we have major disturbances from the sun, namely like M-class flares, X-class flares, big coronal mass ejections, it causes a lot of disturbance in the geomagnetic field and it causes wild distortions in the geomagnetic field. And that's where we get all of the bad stuff that we associate with uh, with solar activity from a ham radio standpoint. Um, this is when our, our A and K indices go way up, things get really noisy, major solar storms, radio blackouts, which are very common, power grids can be affected in worst case scenarios and that sort of thing. And so the A and K indices were basically developed so that we can have an easily digestible numeric method of you know basically considering and assessing the condition of our electromagnetic field at any given time. This this stuff causes aurora so when we have coronal mass ejections, X-class flares, M-class flares uh, that's where we get the aurora borealis as I'm sure all of you know um, but we get uh, stuff that looks like this and this is this is I made sure to pick actual real photos um, of the aurora borealis and uh, this is just the the uh, ionization and excitation of the electromagnetic field at the poles there is aurora borealis and there's also southern aurora as well this is northern aurora solar flux index in general can uh, can be quantified this way with, with, with result to what's happening uh, with the magnetic field. So quiet, quiet, unsettled. We see this all the time on all of the reporting stuff. And, uh, and so we haven't seen one of these in a really long time, but we've seen a lot of active and a lot of minor storms since the beginning of solar cycle 25. And you know, hopefully we get more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff uh, as the solar cycle continues to ramp up. We're two years in now and things are finally starting to look up a little bit as far as radio uh, wave propagation. Um, just give you a, just a quick little, uh, a little sample of what coronal holes are. These are areas where the solar wind and other particle matter is, is greatly accelerated to, and if the, and if this area or these coronal hole areas are earth directed on the on the earth facing disk this is where we can start to get you know all of the wild stuff that that we uh, that we associate with with storms and, and and noise and all of that all of that kind of stuff Let's see what else i've got here that i haven't shown you yet uh, for those of you who remember there was a x class flare event back in october and i've got the uh, nasa data of the NASA imagery from it 
um, from the Space Weather Prediction Center. This is fascinating to me, uh, partly because this is just a really great looking solar flare, uh, the coronal mass ejection. There's a, there's, there, there was the X-Class flare right there. Let me see if I can back that up and play it one more time. That was a really good representation of a, of a solar flare and the coronal mass ejection uh, that, accompany, that accompanies it. And then here's another really good representation of it. Just fascinating to look at. That's, yeah, that was, I don't know uh, necessarily, Winston, if that's at, you know, 100% speed or if they sped it up or, or what. Um, but I know that these things are fast. They can get to us in a matter of days. And so we have generally, you know, 24 to 48-ish hours, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on the event, to prepare. And this particular X-Class flare that we're looking at, it caused a radio blackout in Europe and Asia, and it also causes a power grid to go, to go down in parts of California, which maybe isn't that surprising. They take their own power down half the time anyway, but, but this one knocked out power in Northern California for a significant amount of time. So the dangers associated with these are real, and I'll, I'll, I'll close my little, uh, my little presentation kind of on this thought. We always talk about how the sun is going to continue to go on for a long, long, long time and it's going to, get, it's going to turn into a red giant and it's going to consume the earth and the inner planets and all that. But I would submit to you this thought, just kind of as a thought experiment. Long before that ever happens, the, the sun is going to kill the earth, but it's not going to be by becoming a red giant. It's going to be by giving us a kill shot. It's going to send one of these flares at an X... 200 level directly at us. The, st the cosmos are going to align just perfectly and we're going to get the kill shot. I don't know. I mean, is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen uh, 100,000 years from now? I don't know. But the probability, if you're into probabilities and that sort of thing, the probability of this happening, destroying the earth, is actually mathematically much greater than the earth surviving and, and uh, going on, you know, humanity going on to the point where the, the earth becomes consumed by the sun becoming a red giant. I don't know, it's just kind of something interesting to think about. You know, from a probability standpoint, the kill shot is, what, is what's going to get us. That's how the sun's going to get us. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. That underlying picture there, I thought I saw the earth in the distance, a little blue orb. Oh, on the underlying picture? Yeah. Uh, well, there are a bunch of... This is an artist embellishment, and I think those are just... A little blue orb, I think that's probably... Yeah, yeah. Could be. Yeah, but that, uh, I just thought this was a really pretty embellishment of a coronal mass ejection. It gives you a good idea of just how big they are and how powerful they are. Mark? So we, we hear about solar wind, so... There's, there's constantly solar winds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's why our that's why our geomagnetic field, as I understand it, is never perfectly. We're never a perfect dipole. The geomagnetic field is always being affected upon by the sun, by the solar wind. And solar wind does it have any relation to CMEs? Well, during a CME, the solar wind that accompanies it and that is ahead of it and behind it is accelerated with the CME. That's my understanding, you know. Yeah, that sounds like a good number to me. I don't know. That's what you always see on the space. Well, if you around 360, sometimes 500. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. I mean, if you were to say, if if we detect a CME and we and they say, hey, we're gonna, it's gonna be here in two and a half days, we predict. Well, it's pretty easy to just take the distance between here and the sun and do a little bit of algebra, and you can figure out the approximate speed of the particles heading toward us. Yeah, and that sounds like a good number. Ninety-three million. Mm -hmm. Just generally in the ninety-three million mile range. Yeah. <laughs> Give or take, depending on where we are, yeah. So we have the the two scales of, I guess, the index, the A and the K. Mm -hmm. Why is there two? I could not find a decent explanation for that. I think that part of it has to do with. I'm completely speculating here, but I think that that because the 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 logarithmic index can change so quickly. 
and it's and it can be particular to certain areas it's good to have the average so that we have an overall look at what is happening to to the geomagnetic field as a whole that may have something to do with it but i couldn't find any really good explanation for that matthew maybe he's got something yeah, I, I kind of just looking. sure um the gain this computed once every three hours eight times a day the values range from zero to nine with zero being connected and nine representing Extreme severe storm conditions. Right. The values are quasi logarithmic. So it ranges from zero to nine. Mm -hmm. The K of index is linear and is computed from the eight previous K index values. Okay. So it's zero a zero moving zero average in a way. To 400, yes. Mm -hmm. Moving average. Moving average. Mm -hmm. So, and then generally propagation conditions are best when the A index is 15 or lower and the K index is 3 or lower. Right. So. The, the A is your your average of the the past eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's basically the past day. One other note on that. Um, when we get up into these high numbers and we have a, a major storm, uh a minor storm, major storm, severe storm, whatever, especially during the major and severe storms, once that storm is over and the geomagnetic field starts to go back to its regular shape and is less disturbed and starts to settle down, you get you can get incredible propagation on those for like a day, day and a half after the storm is over and the geomagnetic field is sort of resetting itself. Incredible things can happen on HF radio during that time. Yeah, because because you've got all of that charge, you've got all of that ionospheric charge but at the same time, the storm is over and things are kind of kind of settling down, and and going back to a more predictable model. So that's always something to look look out for. I learned that from Dave Kassler, and I should also say that part of the information that I got from this was from Dave Kassler's YouTube channel. He is K E zero O G. He's a retired engineer and a brilliant guy. And uh, he and I got some of my information from him, and I also found an old article from QST online from 2002 that explains this in a lot more mathematical detail, especially with regard to solar flux and the and the electromagnetic indices. So you guys can look that that stuff up if you want to as well. I, in fact, I can post it on the club page. So, mm -hmm. well, sunspots. Uh, I think we you and I have talked about it on the air before, but. There's like you were talking about spots on the on those sides. You had that picture. Mm -hmm. Well, don't know. the sun does rotate every 28 days, correct? Uh, something like that, yeah. So if they're in seven days, those ones facing to the side of us are going to be pointing at us. Yeah, these one these ones will be put. So if this was real, if this wasn't just something I drew. These would all be moving in to, toward the center and, and potentially toward us with regard to the particle matter and radiation. Uh, and these ones would be moving away. But this would be kind of a lull. So we'd have a real high sunspot number here. Well, you know, whatever. Oh, check it out, man. We got 150 sunspots, 120 sunspots, and nothing's happening. This could, this could be why. And that's where the solar flux index as a proxy becomes valuable. It's one of the ways it becomes valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I used to, many years ago, we always used to just depend on what the sunspot number was and mm -hmm. waiting for those numbers to come up and all that stuff yeah. back in the early 80s. And uh, now it's that solar flux index number you need to be looking at. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I was I was the same way. I got interested in this because when I came back to ham radio, I mean, I was I, I kept my license all those years, but I was so inactive for about 18 or so years and 19 years. When I came back, sun the, the the condition of the sun was not the way it was when I left. Man, in the 90s, it was awesome. I could come home every day. The radio was going crazy. You could pick your band. You could talk to anybody you wanted anywhere. It was so easy. When I came back in the late summer of 2020, dude, it sucked. I was like, what happened to everything? Did the sun die? <laughs> and it actually had died. And so I started digging into I wanted to understand better why, how sunspot cycles work and their effect on ham radio. And I just kind of wanted to 
be able to make better predictions for myself. And so, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And another thing we haven't talked about with regard to all this is the maximum usable frequency, but we're kind of out of time. And I don't want to, I don't want this to drag on and bore you guys too much, but all of this also relates very much to the, to the maximum usable frequency. When you get really, really good uh, uh, SFI and it's affecting the geomagnetic field in a, in a positive constructive way that is where your MUF starts, mo starts moving way up. Six meters starts opening up and all the really groovy stuff starts to happen up on the higher part of the HF spectrum. Um, but, that, but that's a delicate thing because usually when you get super high solar flux um, you'll have it for a while, but then with super high solar flux and a lot of sunspots comes, you know, those, mag those, those magnetic fights on the, ban on the surface of the sun and then, you know, sun CMEs start happening and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's good as a tool to kind of keep an eye on that and see when conditions, you know, might be right. So that's kind of how I've been using it. And I've been, I feel like I have improved my ability to assess what's going to happen and maybe what band I should spend the most time checking out, you know, based on analyzing some of this stuff. So, what websites do you use to get your information? Uh, I use spaceweatherlive.com, which is really good, and also I have uh, I have a, a page that I built secret. It's a secret page on my website. I'll put some guys have it. Uh, I'll I'll just put it on the club page and. What I did is I built a web page that aggregates in data from the Australian Space Weather Service, spaceweatherlive.com, those little bugs that we all use that that one guy uh, has the website. You can have, they have the, those bugs with all the data uh, and you can you know, put, them, put them wherever you want. I've got a bunch of those data bugs in there. I've got uh, a bunch of different imagery of the sun in real time or as close to real time as I get and I got that from NASA and I just piped all of that data into one web page and it constantly updates. Um, every once in a while I'll just refresh the page in case something doesn't update but I'll, I will post that on the uh, on the website. I'll post that on the club page rather so everybody can have it. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what else I use for space weather data, but definitely the Australian Space Weather Service, if you guys don't ever use that, that's really good. Um, they have a, they've got an MUF map that is as accurate as I've, as I've ever seen. And you can make really good predict predictions based on that too. So, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. We finally got it done. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.